Here we are. So welcome everybody. Uh, here we are for this new event by Minerva Lab. Today we are really happy because we have uh, a, a full workshop uh, that brings us to discuss about the relationship between uh, industrial relations and, and gender equality, or better, uh, we should say gender equity. Uh, we have five papers. Uh, each paper has 15 minutes, uh, and then uh, at the end, of course, we will have uh, uh, an open discussion. But in the meantime, uh, you can put questions uh, in the questions and answers, uh, and of course, we will take care of, of them uh, throughout uh, the workshop. Uh, this is the order of the presentations. We will start uh, with uh, a paper concerning Europe. So. Obviously, when we speak about Europe, actually, we speak about the European Union. And this will be a paper on social dialogue effects on wages, evidence for employed women in, in Europe, uh, meaning, again, a European Union. This is something stemming from a project that we have just carried out. But I will leave the floor to, to Julia Zakia to present this, this paper. We will then move uh, to Spain and the Netherlands with a paper by Carla Brega, Beitelman, and Jana Besamuska, and Mara Yerkes, that is not here with us, the last one, but Jana and, and Carla are with us. Uh, then we will concentrate on France uh, with a very nice paper by Anne-Sophie Bruno that is not still here, but she will join us uh, uh, quite soon. Ilenia Curci, Natalie Greenan, and Jeremy Tanguy that are here today. Then. We will move to Italy with two papers, uh, one by Armanda Cetrullo and Valeria Cirillo, and last but not least, uh, one by Erika Loe, uh, Eleonora Del Vecchio, and myself. So as you can see, it's a very rich program, and I don't want to waste any more time, and I give the floor immediately to Giulia Zacchia. So thank you so much, Marcella. I will share my screen. I hope that you can see. Um, fully. Um, so as you already told, uh, this is a work uh, done in the framework of the Viraj pro pro uh, project that was financed by the European Union. And uh, these are the ones that I represented today are the result of uh, more empirical um, analysis that uh, we uh, carried out uh, for this project. Uh, then we will have more qualitative uh, facts uh, on uh, mainly on Italy that will be presented by Erika Anoui in the frame of the same project. Um, of course, I will have just a few minutes today, 15 minutes, uh, and uh, uh, so I will go quickly on the main results and the structure of the, of the analysis that we have done. But if you want, we prepare a full paper uh, that you can download in the website of uh, uh, the project. And here you have the link for going more in detail of what I will present to you today. Uh, so we concentrated our analysis uh, um, on uh, social dialogue and mainly looking at how social dialogue can support gender equality in terms of ensuring high level of wages for women employees in Europe at the European level, so European Union member states. Um, so our uh, study focused mainly on women employees, so not uh, we are not going through uh, the gender wage gap, but we look at just uh, uh, women employed in the formal labor market at the European level, and we concentrate mainly on what we call the within company social dialogue. And this is thanks to the availability of micro data uh, by the Eurofound in the European Working condition survey, the last release that we have in 2015, that introduces a new questions that let us know exactly if at the company or organization level of the female worker of the workers of course. In general, uh, there is a trade union, a work council, or a committee representing employees. And this is, again, our main focus to look at if 
having such a kind of, um, uh, of uh, committee representing and voicing uh, the needs and the rights and the necessities of workers have an impact on hourly wages uh, for women employees in the, the formal labor market. So thanks to this uh, really new question that was introduced in the survey, we had the opportunity to quantify the coverage of uh, within companies social dialogue. And we can say that in general, the 48% of employees in the European Union, eight, uh, 28, so that was, uh, of course, if, before the Brexit, uh, say that they were exposed to within company social dialogue machinery in their workplaces. As you can see, the shares uh, are lower uh, for women and men. However, uh, the coverage, uh, and this is evident from the two maps that you can have, here, um, it's really heterogeneous among the European core countries, with lower, uh, with lowest incidence for the European, for the Eastern European countries, uh, mainly for women workers. But the differences in the coverage of within company social dialogue uh, is also at the industry uh, level. And here we can see that uh, the lowest social dialogue coverage for women are for those that work in the private households and in a hotel and restaurant services. So using this micro data that are available, uh, for all the European countries, uh, we uh, could estimate uh, the conventional means of log equation regressions to define the fact of this within social dialogue on the level of wages uh, for women employees, controlling for, for many dimensions that can influence the level of wages for women. So we control for personal characteristics of the female workers in terms of course of age, educational level, and migrant status. But, and this is the reason why we're concentrating mainly on women, we introduce a control for those dimensions that can hint mostly on women and on the level of wages that women employed uh, can reach. And that are, of course, the family care burden, so the family status, the number of children, and the specific subject uh, dimensions that is asked in the questionnaire. The gender occupational segregation, mainly in terms of feminization of the workplaces, the employment segregation, so looking at the time of occupation, private public sectors, part-time, uh, full-time, uh, temporary jobs or not, but mainly we concentrate enough that, that for us was of crucial importance. So looking at the working conditions of uh, those workers, of female workers, and men in terms of having a supportive work environment and being at higher health and sexual harassment risk at their workplaces. Of course, we are completely aware that women are not all the same. So to stress the heterogeneity among women employees in Europe, we calculate this wage effect of within company social dialogue by occupational status to define the differences between high skill and low skill female workers, but also to look at differences in the blue and white collar jobs, to look at the differences by the level of gender equality of each country that we measured with the European Institute of Gender Equality level in the Gender Equality Index, of course, I mean, the 2017 uh, index that is related to the 2050 data that we use for the main analysis of uh, error found data, micro data. And we also look at how these social dialogue dimensions can enhance on the women wages, looking at 
different different industrial relation uh, regimes. So I'll show you briefly. I mean, uh, the um, the magnitude of this effect uh, that I mean was not absolutely so affected when we talk about this uh, uh, conceptualization of the studies. So we found a really a significant and positive role of within company social dialogue as always uh, a significant and positive effect you see in all the specifications. And uh, this means mainly that being exposed to social dialogue in the workplaces increases the wages of women from 7% to 24% at the European level. Of course, the differences in the, the shares depends on the, uh, on the dimensions that we consider in our uh, model. Um, and so, I mean, this is a of huge importance because, I mean, the impact of social dialogue can, uh, of course, also be a means of contrast uh, for the increasing in gender wage gap or the TAD, as you already we have seen, unfortunately, in the presentation of the new AG uh, index. Uh, now, nowadays, uh, the steady levels of differences in gender equality. Um, so, moreover, we found out that social dialogue, as it stands to the interaction currency that we run, um, so the social dialogue coverage tends to mitigate the negative effect of different social identities that interact with the fact of being women in the formal labor market and in the wages. So, the migrant status, the feminizations of the workplaces, the family and social commitments and care activities can burden the fact of uh, working in a small size company that tends to reduce uh, the wages of women, but also <laughs> the effect of the wage effect of being a very risk of sexual harassment for women and their level of wages. So looking more in detail, say the differences once more among those women, those female workers at the European level, looking at uh, the occupational status and running for these uh, um, uh, disproportions also for different sub uh, uh, samples of uh, uh, our uh, our data set, uh, data, data set uh, uh, we can say that the impact of social dialogue is higher for low skilled women as we were affected than for white collar employees. And this is important to support policy recommendations, of course. If we look at uh, the level of gender equality achieved by the single European countries, we can say that uh, uh, the returns of social dialogue for women uh, in terms of, of, of higher wages are evident and significant just for those countries with the level of uh, gender equality that is equal or above or uh, far above the European average. So this is hence the importance of the social context and the level of institutional uh, gender equality machinery at all level, not only at level of social data. But uh, the other dimensions that we uh, consider also is really related with the project that uh, we run. And so it's the definitions of the entire barrage project that uh, define five different groups and uh, five different uh, um, uh, types of industrial relations regimes at the European level that can be labeled, you see, as North, Center, West, South. West and Central East, and with different kind of bargaining le levels, different time of regimes from organized uh, corporatization to the social partnership to state-centered uh, regimes of industrial relations and liberal imperialism um, aspect and regimes. So taking an account of these uh, concepts, these uh, uh, grouping of countries in this five different dimensions related to different types of um, industrial regimes. So we also run 
uh, the uh, our our model to see how this uh, social dialogues uh, effect will be different uh, for women employees in these five different kinds of uh, industrial leadership regimes. And so we find out that uh, the effect of social dialogue is more significant for women in the Western, in the Western Central, Western, and Southern countries than in the Northern and Central Eastern countries. So just to conclude, and then of course, we can discuss more in detail these different uh, dimensions that we consider or different uh, variables that we consider and which are the main implications. But I want to leave you with I mean, what we I mean, could do and what we can add thanks to the analysis of this new micro data that uh, we had at the opportunity to use. So uh, we can add and that uh, this uh, positive effect of social, uh, of social dialogue on wages for women employees, uh, of course, is high. And so it's an important component if we want also to tackle the problem of gender inequalities and mainly of the gender wage gap and the difference implications in the gender pension gap uh, in the second part in the second part of our living. Um, so but what we found out is also that the wage effect is not homogeneous among different uh, female workers. And so we have to look at the differences and the heterogeneity in the characteristics of uh, women working in the uh, different uh, European member states. We found out, in fact, that the fact is higher for low skilled women and white collar workers, but still, the reason high, really high at heterogeneity among the different European countries. That's of course call for I mean, local really focused policies to uh, implement and to uh, correct the inequalities uh, that we uh, always see is still in our uh, labor markets. Um, so if we want to define some policy implications from our empirical analysis, we can suggest Absolutely, that the fact of unpaid family and social bar, uh, social burden, and the hostile working conditions, mainly in terms of uh, higher risk of sexual harassment in the workplaces, uh, on wages should be considered and monitored as a first critical step for setting policies that can voice force the right in the formal labor market of women and working women in the uh, labor market at the European level. But I think that um, we could expand this also at the, the international level for comparison. So I will stop here. Uh, of course, I will be happy if you have comments or demands. Uh, you can write in also because um, unfortunately I have to leave yeah, uh, but you will be back. You will be but back. I will so... be back, but of course, I mean, that was, I mean, really brief, but all the details, all the variables that we use and definitions, you also can find it in the uh, working paper that uh, is available and you can download it and see it. Yes, yes, it's in the chat. The link is already in the chat, Julia. Perfect. And we wait for you for the discussion anyway. So because the discussion will be at the end after the, the five papers. So you will be in time for, for the discussion eventually. I hope that I respect it all the time. <laughs> absolutely. Okay, yeah, fine. Absolutely, absolutely. Usually I'm not. <laughs> yeah, otherwise I would stop you. So <laughs> it's okay. Uh, so thank you so much. In the meantime, I also put in the chat uh, for everybody the order of our presentation, of our presentations. And as I said before, we now move from the European Union to Spain and the Netherlands. Uh, the paper is by Carla Brega, Beidelman, Ayana Besamuska, and Mara Yerkes. So, Carla, you can start sharing your screen uh, since you will be the presenter. The floor is yours, uh, 15 minutes.
I'm unmuted. And yes, we can hear yes. you. Okay, perfect. So then, good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity uh, to be here today. My name is Carla Brega. I am a PhD candidate at the Department of Interdisciplinary Social Science of Utrecht University. And the paper, the paper that I'm going to talk about today, Flexible Work Arrangements in Collective Agreements, Evidence from Spain in the Netherlands is Work in Progress, with co-authors Mara Yerks and Jana Samuska, also present here today. So, flexible work arrangements is a significant role in the combination of paid work, care, and leisure. So workers may want employee-friendly arrangements to ease tensions between family and work pressures. But flexible work arrangements can have paradoxical effects. They can reinforce gendered roles in paid and unpaid work, and they can exacerbate class-based inequalities in well-being because they're more likely to have negative consequences such as unpaid overtime or fluctuating schedules for workers in lower socioeconomic positions. These negative effects can exacerbate when the main objective of FWAs, as I'm gonna call them now, is the increase is to increase employers' discretion in the organization of the production processes. This means that flexible work arrangements are a space for dispute of workers' interest in flexibility for their well being and employer driven flexibility. Collective bargaining agreements are an understudied yet key arena in which these conflicting but not necessarily unaligned interests are embodied. So, Current studies have mainly used individual level data to provide evidence of inequalities in access to FWAs at the national company level, but this has not yet been supported by data on flexible work arrangements as agreed upon in collective agreements. So we have an incomplete picture. Addressing this is especially important in countries where the access to formal work-life practices for many employees is heavily influenced by collective bargaining agreements. We focus on two such countries, Spain and the Netherlands. In Spain, we must know that statutory provision of FWAs is mostly absent. The legislation only offers broad guidelines and encourages FWAs to be voluntarily agreed upon in collective bargaining processes. In the Netherlands, there's a detailed and extensive national statutory provision of FWAs, but legislation mandates social partners to amend such, regula such regulations via collective agreements. So our guiding questions are, to what extent do Spain and the Netherlands differ in the provision of flexible work arrangements through collective agreements? What type of provision? And to what extent does the availability of such provision vary within these countries across sectors? Well, we focus our analysis on collective agreements that contain clauses on four types of FWX. Flexible working hours, meaning the ability to choose from a predefined set of schedules or to vary start and end times working. Telework, which is working from a different location than the usual workplace, including the home. Flexibility to extend leave provisions, for example, returning to work following maternity leave in a flexible manner. And changing work status from full to part time and vice versa. Collective agreements. So we know are embedded in collective bargaining systems. And this might be a possible explanation for why countries differ in terms of uh, collectively negotiated flexible work arrangements. Higher level bargaining with coordination between different negotiation units that leave some room for bargaining specific applications at the firm level, but respecting favorability principles might be more receptive to progress on FWAs. Such structures can widen the field of comparison of employment conditions, can put more pressure on employers than individual workers or low level bargaining, and can more effectively counter pressure and favorable working conditions. Second, the characteristics of the workers in a sector uh, that a collective agreement will potentially cover are a likely source for differences across sectors in terms of collectively negotiated FWAs. In the literature, there are two main mechanisms driving FWA provision and access for particular workers, the principle of equity and the principle of need. According to the equity principle, FWAs should be easier to negotiate in sectors where employees will bring the greatest benefit to the firm through improved performance results, thus in sectors with highly skilled workers and or technology intensive. 
In such sectors, occupations can be more easily done remotely. Uh, autonomy over working hours is unlikely to harm productivity. And employers might accommodate employees' demands because they are harder to replace. According to the principle of need, WAs could be easier to negotiate in sectors where employees need them the most. So sectors covering predominantly female population of workers. This is of course rooted in traditional gender roles. So female workers are more likely in need of FWAs to combine their work and family demands and or might be willing to trade off pay for other types of family friendly benefits. So to understand how collective agreements can influence the availability and type of FWA, we need a brief notion of how the Dutch and the Spanish collective bargaining systems work. The main level of collective bargaining is sectoral in both countries. An extension of collective agreements to entire sectors is common, so they cover most of the working population. In the Netherlands, uh, sector levels agreements set broad framework conditions, but leave ample room for film level negotiation of detailed provisions, complementing or deviating from the standard terms set at a higher level. Coordination between bargaining units is strong, usually with the sector setting the targets first and others following. In Spain, sectoral level agreements predominantly set framework conditions and leave little room for modification of the terms at the firm level. And since the reform in 2012, uh, firm level agreements can generally apply less favorable terms than those negotiated at higher level agreements. The coordination also between bargaining units, it's weak. Now to understand a little bit uh, the variation across sectors, I'll briefly name some of their characteristics. The sectors comprised comprise in our analysis are manufacturing, including mining and coring, construction, including water supply, sewage and waste, commerce, including retail, hospitality and transport, and the public sector, including education and healthcare. In both countries, manufacturing and construction are male-dominated industries. The public sector female dominated and commerce is gender balanced. Public sector has the biggest share of highly skilled workers followed by manufacturing and unionization varies, uh, varies across sectors with the public sector traditionally having high bargaining power. For exploration, we use the wage indicator data set on collective bargaining agreements, which compiles more than 600 coders, coded Clause by clause collective agreements from 28 European countries. And our sample consists of 209 collect collective agreements, 101 from the Netherlands and 108 from Spain, covering from 2008 to 2025, not necessarily following. Uh, our analysis is descriptive. This is what we can do with our data. So, first, uh, it's important to have in mind that in Spain, the majority of the agreements in the sample are negotiated with a single employer, while the majority of the Dutch are multi-employer agreements. Uh, we will roughly understand single employer as firm level agreements and multi-employer as sectoral agreements. However, we, have, we must be cautious in the interpretation because the comparison between single and multi-employer agreements is not straightforward due to their, pot their potential different coverage. Okay, I will briefly um, tell you about our main findings now. Um, first, uh, FWA clauses are more often found in Spanish than in Dutch collective agreements. The likely reason is the different baseline statutory provision that, we, that I talked about earlier that is much detailed in the Netherlands. Second, in Spain, you will see that multi-employer multi agreements more often include FWAs than single employer ones. But the data suggests that the same type of arrangement tends to be negotiated at both levels. The coordination between bargaining units in Spain must be telling us that there is repetition of negotiated FWAs due to disorganized and or overlapping bargaining structures. However, the high centralization in combination with the priority given to the firm level agreements since 2012 indicate that the firm level negotiations are by reassessing simply trying to prevent the deterioration of the baseline flexible work arrangements negotiated at a higher level. Both countries, flexible hours and the protected possibility to make 
Changes in work statuses are by far the most covered type of arrangement, independently of the level of the agreement. Next, uh, we see our uh, main findings when comparing sectors. First, manufacturing within the private sector is the highest, has the highest proportion of collective agreements within cl with clauses on FWAs. FWAs might be easier to negotiate or to be employee friendly in manufacturing, a male dominated sector with a lot of highly skilled workers, because even if FWAs might not be perceived as highly needed, they might be convenient for both employees and employers and backed up by relatively high bargaining power. Salaries are already set at high levels in the sector, so other well being benefits are negotiable. And there might be actually low cost for employers as they might expect that the majority of male worker, workers are not likely to make extensive use of the negotiated arrangements. Second, uh, public sector agreements are the one that's most likely including clauses on FWAs, but only in Spain. FWAs might be easier to negotiate or be employee friendly in the public sector female dominated with a highly skilled workforce because FWAs might be needed as well as profitable. And negotiations are endorsed by, by high bargaining power. Anyways, other factors that may play a role would be the traditional weight on the public sector of being a model employer. Third, I'll go back here. We see that uh, collective agreements in construction and the commerce sector include clauses on FWAs in a similar proportion, lower than the other two sectors. Construction is male dominated, while commerce is more gender balanced, but they both have a low proportion of highly skilled workers. FWAs might be more difficult to negotiate in these sectors because there might be a low to medium perceived need for them, as well as low profitability for employers. However, one could argue that in these sectors, employers can be particularly interested in, for example, extended opening times during evenings or the weekend, thus push employer-driven FWAs. But since flexibility might reduce planability and reliability of working time, it would make sense, of course, for workers to actively resist flexible working practices. Moreover, uh, low bargaining power and focus on more immediate monetary benefits could hinder opportunities for negotiation. Also, we must have, take into account that presence of female workers is not necessarily enough as in commerce. Unions still might operate under a male norm of employment. I'm, Emma, I'm you have just one minute left. Eh? Consider WA as, as relevant. The last important thing uh, to mention here is that commerce is, commerce is the only sector that covers all four types of, uh, of flexible work arrangements in both, both countries, indicating that gender diver diversity in the workforce might be advantages for the negotiation of maybe not a lot, but a variety of work-life arrangements. So find support uh, for collective bargaining systems driving differences in the inclusion of FWAs in collective agreements. Of course, institutional settings and path dependency of industrial relations are of key importance. We also find support for the principles of need and equity driving sectoral differences, but union power is key. I'll leave it there and uh, thank you. I hope to hear from you. Thank you, Carla. Thank you so much. Yes, indeed. So you can stop sharing now. Is it working? I pressed, I pressed stop share, but it just doesn't stop. You did it before, so you can manage. Come on. So in the meantime... It is, it is my turn, because if it is my turn, I can end the uh, kind of presentation. I'm sorry. Uh, where is the... It is, uh, it is my turn. Three, okay, so it's my turn. I hand Carla's presentation. Can you yes, hear please, me? Elenia. Yes, okay. if you don't mind. Yes, thank okay. you so much. So, uh, can you share this, my screen? Yes, yes, we do. We do. Okay. Thank you, Elenia. So we're now moving to France with Elenia and, of course, our co authors. Please, Elenia, introduce the others. Okay. So um, thank you, Marcella, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, 
so my name is Ilania Kurti. I'm presenting this paper that I co-authored with uh, Anne-Sophie Bruno, uh, Nathalie Grinan, and Jeremy Tanguy. They, are, they should be all here now. Uh, so the, the, um, the title of the paper is Bargaining with Purpose is the French Policy Framework Promoting Gender Equality in uh, the Workplace. But this paper is a part of a big project that ended a few months ago, that is the CAGE project. So I just say a few words about this because it helps us understand in the context. So CAGE stands for Collective Agreement for Gender Equality. Uh, so what is the point? The point is in France, we have a very peculiar uh, system. So French, for French firm receive a, a top-down uh, obligation from the government to find internal solution. And it provides a framework, uh, they will provide a, a framework which is very precise. But however, even though we have a lot of laws saying what we should do, what we have to do, uh, there is basically no monitoring system to check whether the um, firms are doing it or not. So uh, in France, we face a uh, high risk uh, that uh, uh, firms do not comply with the law. So the objective of the CAGE uh, project is to explore, understand, and evaluate this uh, uh, mechanism, this kind of policies, what that we call uh, what the literature or uh, administrative bargaining policy. Uh, and to do so, we build a research infrastructure uh, that allow us to uh, conduct quantitative analysis. The, the research I'm, pre I'm presenting today, so the paper I'm presenting today, is to evaluate the behavior of companies in terms of bargaining on professional gender equality. And we have a uh, twofold objective. So first, we try to answer the question, is this top-down obligation enough to push companies to negotiate and produce a bargaining text, bearing in mind, of course, that there is no monitoring system. And also, we ask ourselves if uh, uh, are some firms doing this better than others, in, at least in terms of uh, effort they put into the negotiation, as if it is reflected on the text, in the text. So this slide somehow like one year, maybe one year and a half of work. Uh, so this is how we build the sketch database. Uh, we merge different, five different sources of information. We started from uh, the, a survey that is called the Repons, uh, Repons survey. Uh, we took the 2017 wave. Uh, and why we took this? Well, because it's a lot of, it has a lot of nice information, but also because it is representative of uh, the universe of French firm. So uh, we took all the firm uh, identified in the survey and we merged the, uh, those information with the uh, information about the salaries with uh, an administrative source. And also we merged about, uh, with another administrative database uh, that uh, collect information about uh, all the texts, the, all the negotiated uh, or not <laughs> texts uh, issued by those firm. And all this information has been then enriched with the uh, information that we um, uh, we created by text mining the the text issued by those firm at a uh, firm level, but also by the text with the text uh, with the information issued um, text mining in the text uh, issued at um, industry level. So we have a huge database, and for this paper in particular, we focus on our 2014-2016 time span. So we end up with a database with the uh, 4,364 entries, which are the firm in response. They are associated with the information from uh, to the most recent text that they published, and also with the reference uh, industry text. <laughs> Our theoretical framework is quite articulated. We have, um, so we ask ourselves, uh, uh, what are the different dimensions that have an impact uh, on the bargaining process? And uh, so we individuated three different dimensions. The first one is the bargaining environment. So the idea is, um, well, as the literature suggests, is the legal provision have an uh, uh, influence uh, the, the, the behavior of firms? Uh, so France has, has a very peculiar case so with with this top-down obligation to find bottom-up solution. 
And also we look at the interaction with the bargaining, what is happening uh, at industry level, the bargaining happening at industry, industry level, because in France, uh, we are supposed to, the uh, French uh, firm level and the industry level is supposed to be complementary. <laughs> Uh, another dimension is uh, uh, the employer identity and collective involvement. So we look at the intra-firm governance. Uh, and then the idea is uh, to look at the ability uh, of the governance to bring together the different voices inside uh, the firm. And then, um, and then we also look at uh, the dimension of the employee representation and participation. Uh, in particular, we focus on the women to participation rate in labor union because uh, we expect, as the literature suggests, uh, a positive impact on, um, on gender equality. So the higher the number of women, uh, the, uh, the better it is for uh, gender equality bargaining, but also a positive impact in terms of the content of uh, the text. So we expect to, to find more monetary measure uh, inside the text that are bargained by uh, women. <coughs> then we also uh, infer the effort ascended in uh, the production of text um, uh, by looking at two different uh, uh, features that the literature identifies as, as crucial. So, um, the first one relates to the relationship with the normative text. In, in our case, the normative text is the, um, the industry text. The, the question is, I think just implementing what we found already uh, at the industry level, and we, we, we call it a pre-packaged equality kit, uh, because the literature say that a good text it should not be standard, so it should not just be a copycat of the industry text, um, because it doesn't have to copy it, it has to complement it. <clears throat> and then we also look at the degree of concreteness of text, uh, because uh, as uh, the literature suggests that good text proposes several concrete actions to tackle inequality. So to capture these two dimensions, we, uh, we created two indicators. Uh, one is a jacker distance, which is uh, a distance from the text issued firm level with respect to the reference text uh, industry level. And the other is, uh, um, we call it a uh, concreteness um, uh, indicator. <clears throat> um, Sorry, uh, which is uh, an indicator we created by counting, uh, by using text mining technique, we counted the, the concrete measure uh, mentioned inside the text. <laughs> With all this nice information, we run an econometric uh, model. Uh, we run a specific kind of model, which is called two power model for a mixed discrete continuous outcome. And why would we took this one? Because uh, in our interpretation, uh, signing a test, uh, issuing a text on gender equality, and then the quality of this text uh, are basically two parts of the same process. So this model has a problem uh, model uh, to see if the firm has decided to engage the negotiation, so any uh, issue a text, so yes or no. And then we also have a, a truncated model to see if the firm has decided to issue a text uh, uh, what is the level of uh, uh, the effort he put in, into this text <coughs> is reflected in this text. <laughs> so, uh, the results um, to answer the first question is a top obligation enough <coughs> to push companies to negotiate and to produce a uh, bargain text? Well, the answer is uh, it surely isn't, uh, but without it, nothing happens. So what we have observed uh, is that firms that are subjected to the obligation are responding partially, but it's better than nothing because those that are not subjected to the obligations so of small firms are doing nothing. So only 1% of uh, small firms negotiate and issue a text. But still 40% of the firm who should in theory uh, negotiate are not compliant with the law. On the good side, we can see that when firms start negotiating, they keep doing it. So, well, we'll, well we have a good news. Uh, and so then we move to, to, to look if uh, there are firms that are doing better than the others in terms of the, uh, the effort. 
what we have found is that, uh, well, first of all, in order to negotiate on gender equality, one has to be able to negotiate. So we observe a significantly higher probability for companies that have a past negotiating experience on non-gender uh, uh, equality issue to produce a tax on gender equality. So the idea is uh, negotiating on gender equality, it's hard. Uh, it requires a, a, an apparatus. And if this apparatus is already in place for other reason, then of course uh, it's easier. So the, the gender equality bargaining can be carried out with a diminishing um, marginal cost. Uh, another thing that we observe is that to negotiate on gender equality, companies also need negotiators, of course. And uh, in particular, we observe that when a company has no employee representative or poorly uh, structured bodies, uh, they are likely good at producing uh, a gender equality tax to decrease significantly. <laughs> Uh, looking at the different dimension uh, of uh, our theoretical infrastructure, what we observe is that uh, uh, employer engagement uh, in union function leads to uh, take the, um, the obligation more seriously. And also when uh, the management uh, uh, call for the, the help of an uh, external expert, uh, we have a higher probability of signing the text. And um, um, we also see that foreigner firms and worker cooperative and other and other forms of uh, not profit uh, firms have high odds of signing a a, a green um sorry green a gender equality text. Uh, and also we observe that and that is uh, uh, was a bit shocking for us. We observe not influence on the gender of the employee's representative. At the bargaining table, and also not affect of the stock on market exposure. exposure. So, if they are women, if the employee representative are women, there is no effect. If um, the if the the firm is um, is on the stock market, again, no effect. Uh, then we will focus also on this uh, uh, industry uh, firm uh, dynamic which reveal uh, uh, itself to be very complex. So if we look at just what would happen if a firm that negotiated um, uh, a firm, uh, if it, a firm is covered or not by a, um, a tax issue at industry level, what well, the effect is, uh, is known. Uh, but when we look at the interaction between uh, the uh, history of negotiation uh, gender, uh, on gender equality and what happened at industry level, then we find interesting uh, results. So we individuated uh, um, three different categories of, um, of firms. We have the bad guys. So the bad guys will do nothing, uh, never do anything uh, in the past, and, uh, and irrespective if they are covered or not by um, uh, industry uh, level text. Then we have uh, the opportunist, uh, the opportunists uh, are those firms that are mainly driven by the simple desire to avoid the sanction, because the sanction was uh, uh, introduced uh, in a later stage with respect to the obligation. So they started negotiating only when they were facing the, uh, the, uh, the threat of the sanction. So maybe they are the, really the, the kings of uh, the facade uh, equality. We could, and we could we call them the key, the pink washers also, no? <laughs> yeah, yes. Somehow. Two minutes, Elenia. Yes. And then we have uh, the legalists. Uh, the legalists, we call it like this because they started negotiating when the, uh, the, 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 the obligation was created. And uh, we have a mixed feeling about this uh, category of our firms because uh, they're actually separated in two um, micro categories. So we have the others, they were disturbed by the recent activity in the industry. So they were uh, beginning in the past and then uh, the industry started negotiating after them actually. And so they start, they start negotiating. Most probably they, were, they are waiting to see what happened uh, at the industry level. And then we have another category that we call the unshakable legalist. And those are firms that pay little attention to what happened outside the firm. They, they negotiated before, they started negotiating before the other, and they keep doing it like this. So, um, 
how to avoid the green and the um, empty shell. So how to avoid this passing the um, uh, and it's hard to say, but uh, our finding they suggest uh, any uh, how or uh, who what the thing that should be monitored and possibly supported. So we have to uh, look at things that uh, issue action plan instead of agreements because uh, action plan. Um, because the, those firms implement a few uh, concrete actions. We have to look at firms that uh, will lead their bargaining experience uh, as they, their texts are standard and uh, purely concrete. And also uh, monitor firms that do not show proactive behavior at firm level uh, because they rely, because they just copy the, uh, the industry um, uh, agreement. Uh, and then, <clears throat> We also have to pay attention for, to firms where women are underrepresented at, at the bargaining table, uh, where the climate, uh, social climate is conflictual, where the management is not involved in uh, formal organization or foreign affairs, because uh, all those kind of firms produce, uh, on average, uh, tax that are more standard. So to conclude, uh, do we like the French approach? Do we like this uh, top-down obligation to find a bottom-up solution? My, well, hard answer is only, uh, it is good because it starts the process. The problem is that not everybody follow. Uh, so what we would like to do is to deepen the assessment of a different dimension of the negotiation effort we, that we initiated in this uh, uh, article um, in order to evaluate the consequences of the line of action chosen by the firm. In order to, uh, so the idea is to understand those, the consequence of those line of action, not really to, um, to tell firm what they have to do, because firms do not usually like it, but at least to inform them about the consequence of their decision. So, merci pour votre attention, and I'm en français. And thank you. I hope I respected the. Yes, yeah, thank you so much, Elena. No, we had sometimes some problems with your connection, so your voice was coming and going, but I think everything was clear also thanks to the slide. And I forgot to say that we have uh, our students with us, uh, that in the meantime are writing in the, ch in the chat their names. So don't worry if you see their names and numbers because I'm taking care of that. Uh, but the students will stay until 6.30, so that's why I, it's so important that we present the results of all our papers by that time, and then we have half an hour for, for the discussion among us. So now the floor is to Valeria and Armanda that are already <laughs> oh, uh, oh, <laughs> presenting their, their slides. So Valeria is the presenter yes. and the floor is there, of course. Okay, thank you, Marcella, for your introduction. Uh, I will present this um, work, joint work with Armanda Cetulo from uh, Santana School of Advanced Studies, or where myself, or with myself, um, I am working in the university at the University of Bari. Uh, well, as you said, uh, we are going. Uh, we are focusing on Italy. Actually, the title of our work is "Bargaining on Gender Equality at Workplace in Italy." Um, let me start uh, with a very quick overview on the Italian labor market and the gender dynamics in the sense that in Italy we have three, at least three main issues when we focus on the labor market from a gender perspective. The first one is related to the employment rate. In fact, we see that the percentage of uh, employment participation of women is really low compared to the other countries and the average European average, uh, um, around 45%. Uh, the, the second major issue concerned the part-time, uh, uh, since women are actually participating to the, to the labor market, but their uh, employment are um, uh, mainly uh, part-time type of jobs. In fact, we see the incidence of part-time is about 30% compared to the others. Of, obviously, Netherlands is a big ex exception also because as uh, Carla was showing, uh, there are uh, specificity concerning the industrial relation in, uh, in, in the Dutch labor market. And the third one, uh, of course, relate to the wage gap. Uh, in fact, when women, if women works, uh, uh, work most of the time uh, we, under part-time arrangement, this means that there is also a difference in terms of intensity, quantity of work over the year. And this is mainly reflected in terms of wages. In fact, we see there is a, a wage gap between 
male, which is actually the blue line and the um, uh, orange line is the one of women across time. This graph is built on the uh, IMSS uh, data. So reflects actually the real annual wage uh, for the two categories. And we see there is this gap over time. So given this background, uh, actually our question was, can collective bargaining contribute to solve, uh, try to solve gender disparities in the Italian labor market? To answer this question, uh, we did a firm level type of exercise starting, first of all, considering the specificity of the uh, industrial, Italian industrial relations system. From this point of view, we have to consider that in Italy, we have uh, two type collective bargaining, which was introduced uh, uh, by the so-called protocol uh, signed between the social parties in the 90, actually in the 1993. Uh, this protocol was setting two types of bargaining. The first one is the sectoral level, uh, which is actually applicable to all firms producing the same uh, or similar product, so basically operating the same sector. And this kind of um, uh, this this kind of agreement uh, usually deal with uh, specific topics such as minimum wage floors, uh, working hours, training specificity. Let me see if I can. Okay. Um, uh, minimum wage floor, uh, of course, uh, uh, that should be updated according to the inflation, uh, so working hours per unit of time, and uh, compulsory training that is uh, usually related to health and safety issues. Then we have a second type of uh, bargaining, which is the company level bargaining, which usually, de which usually deals with issues concerning um, uh, specificity at workplace, such as changes in work organization, working hours, flexible work arrangement, for instance, vocational training, and so on. Uh, why? Because actually the protocol was trying to push uh, uh, workers' involvement in, uh, let's say, in the in the life of the company. Uh, to, uh, to develop, let's say, productivity. And so this was an issue trying to make workers participate at the workplace uh, level uh, through the second level bargaining. Now, what we did in this, uh, from an empirical point of view, we tried to explore which are the main drivers at the firm level, trying to explain um, the probability to uh, include gender clauses in the second level bargaining, so in the company level bargaining, uh, making use of this survey, which is the Rilevazione in Prese Lavoro, which is a firm level survey conducted by INAP in different uh, period of times and covering a representative sample of partnership and limited liability firms. Uh, uh, not in agriculture, in the private sector. We have around 25,000 uh, firms operating uh, per year. Uh, why we decide to use this service? Because in the section F of the, of the survey, which is called actually industrial relation, we have a set of uh, questions covering industrial relation and some issues uh, concerning uh, collective and mainly second level bargaining. So our aim, at least at this age, was trying to see uh, results are preliminary, but try to see if there are specificity of company in terms of corporate governance, structural characteristics, and so on, explaining the probability to negotiate, uh, to apply second level bargaining. First of all, in terms of diffusion, we know that in Italy, the second, uh, the, sorry, the sectoral and the national type of agreements are uh, much more widespread concern to the second level bargaining. In fact, uh, percentage of second level bargaining is in this survey around 4% in 2018. We know from other type of sources such as the ISTAT CNEL um, main survey, this, this, this percentage is about 15%. Uh, in the real survey, we have uh, more or less 4% of companies declaring to have signed second level bargaining, so a company level bargaining. What about the, the sectoral distribution? Uh, so focusing on the pink bar, we see that actually there is a major diffusion in a specific sector, such as the financial and insurance services. Uh, we have also uh, mining, quarrying, transport, mechanical industry. There is a lot of heterogeneity, but, but I would say that financial and insurance services is at, uh, is at the top of the distribution. And uh, uh, this is pretty much confirmed also by the last report uh, written by the Fondazione di Vittorio um, uh, think tank. In terms of geographical distribution, we see that uh, uh, there is a big heterogeneity. 
between north and south of Italy, and also in the north, actually in northwest, uh, there is a much more widespread uh, of uh, second level balloting compared to the west. Um, whereas in the south, you see uh, there is a lower incidence of second level type of agreement. Uh, we in this, uh, I mean, this, this, this survey gives us the, the opportunity to um, focus on the specific, the specific topics covered by the second level uh, agreement. And in particular, we decided to focus on this uh, uh, yellow uh, bar, which is the gender equality and parenting support. So these are basically second level agreement, which include some forms of gender equality and parenting support. Uh, of course, you, you see there are also other type of topic and companies can uh, apply even more than one of this type of uh, uh, let's say clauses and um, type of issues. Uh, for instance, uh, performance bonus and working hours are the more widespread uh, intent of content of the uh, second level bargaining. By the way, we focus on this four percent, which is the use of gender clauses in the sector um, in the second level bargaining, and we see the distribution across sectors as uh, uh, as we expect. Actually, financial and in, in the uh, insurance services uh, are the the sector uh, characterized by a higher diffusion of this uh, type of uh, agreement, uh, I mean, on agreements including uh, gender clauses, then we have also education, health, other business services. Uh, I mean, in the services, it seems there is a major distribution and why uh, this type type of uh, uh, topics are more widespread in services compared to, uh, for example, um, manufacturing, even though, for example, in low value uh, added type of services such as trade and hotel and restaurant, we see the percentage is really uh, modest. Now we we um, take a step forward because we perform um, an econometric analysis and because we, we were interested in uh, the, the main features and characteristics of companies uh, deciding to sign a second level bargaining, but most of all, including the um, gender clauses in the bargaining. So we uh, perform a model where our dependent variable is, is a dichotomous variable indicating whether the firm has regulated equal opportunities parenting support in the second level bargaining and zero otherwise. And then we have this X um, vector, which in includes um, variables concerning education of management, education and composition of the workforce, performance variables such as innovation, value added, side of course, sector of activity, uh, macro regions, and also presence of trade unions and in general uh, type of industrial relation. Uh, I, I stress that this X variable is uh, uh, registered, recorded in uh, 2015, while our outcome is in 2018. Uh, since we know that uh, uh, there is an issue of uh, um, selection, because actually companies including the gender clauses in their second level bargaining are also companies signing second level bargaining, we decide to implement a two stage Jack one model where we uh, estimate the first stage where we basically model the, the probability to sign a second level agreement and then including a variable which is an ex exclusion restriction and then we go to a second step where we are, we are interested in our outcome which is actually uh, uh, the use of gender clauses in the second level bargaining in terms of results um i mean in terms of uh, the first two columns uh, are have been run on all companies while the second two on second level bargaining and then in the in the last two we have the Ekman control the, the, the Ekman control uh, in terms of main results I can I mean these are preliminary but we can see uh, some uh, features and main patterns so the first of all is that uh, firm, family firms uh, when the company is a family firm this is negatively related to the inclusion of uh, um, gender clauses in the second level bargaining, but in general, even with the second level bargaining. Um, then the share of middle-aged workers, this is pretty much consistent across all estimates. This means that companies having a higher share of middle-aged workers are those where more likely we can see second level bargaining, but most of all uh, gender clauses, maybe because workers are interested in the inclusion of clauses concerning work-life balance and so on, because they are in the age 
uh, middle age, so they are uh, they maybe have problem issues with the households and so on. So they push for the inclusion of this type of uh, uh, clauses in the second level bargaining. Um, then we have also the uh, FDI, which is actually a variable concerning the. Uh, export-oriented uh, pattern uh, feature of the company, uh, process innovation, meaning that usually company including uh, second level bargaining and gender clauses are also company performing other type of innovation practices, although process innovation. Of course, union is one of the main predictor, although when we perform the Ekman selection, we see that this variable is not any more significant. So to say that the presence of union is really uh, important when a uh, uh, company decides to sign a second level agreement, but then it's not so uh, crucial when uh, there is an issue concerning gender, the inclusion of gender clauses. This, we should explore a little bit more this variable, but I, I think this is quite interesting. Then, of course, the share of female, uh, this is very much. Uh, uh, I mean, consistent across estimate, although we have in the second level bargaining a negative sign. And this is interesting because it means that usually the share of female is negatively related to the uh, probability to sign a second level agreement, but it's really much related to the presence of second level of gender clauses in the second uh, level agreement. Share of manager, where this manager actually translate in Italian uh, the, uh, let's say, uh, apical type of professions. Uh, this would be dirigenti. So uh, it seems that these kind of practices are much more uh, used and applied in those places where there is a higher share of apical profession. Number of employees, this is uh, very much significant across all estimates, and this is very, uh, in, very much in line with what also is uh, what um, on what is highlighted in the Fondazione di Vittorio last report, saying that actually the firm size is one of the main predictor of uh, second level bargaining and gender type of uh, uh, clauses. Uh, even the geographical location of companies is really important since we see, we see and this was quite evident in the, in the, in the descriptive features, companies located in Northeast and the center uh, have a higher probability to sign gender clauses with uh, respect to companies located in the South and even in the Northwest. Maybe this depends also on the kind of sector specificity. Uh, in this estimate, we control for uh, aggregate sector control. Um, we include, the, uh, sorry, we include aggregate sectoral control. So um, just to, I mean, conclude uh, and say which will be our next step or at least our um, propose for research in the future. Uh, at sectoral level, it seems that collective bargaining lar largely focuses on the protection of women uh, workers during maternity. Uh, this, this was something that we explored previously in, uh, in the sectoral type of analysis. Equal opportunity clauses in general consist mainly on the application of, of law. Um, whereas when we focus on the company level, there is a low diffusion of gender clauses across plants, uh, only this 4%, you remember the yellow bar in the graph. The results uh, are in line with the last release of Fondazione di Vittorio, uh, uh, highlighting that social rights and benefits appears to be more uh, uh, appears to be the last, uh, the least bargained in the 2019-2021 agreement. So compared to the other type of COVID uh, of topic, actually gender clauses are not so considered in the second level bargaining. And significant percentage, uh, there are significant percentage among large companies to say that the size of company is one of the main predictors, but this is all, there is also an explanation, an explanation since larger companies have also a larger number of contracts, which is why the percentage are in general much higher and the topics more varied. So we should try to control for this. So in terms of number of uh, contracts that a large company usually uh, is able to subscribe. Uh, in terms of next step, we would like, first of all, to uh, explore the, uh, the effects of gender equality clauses in second level bargaining on gender disparities at the company level, uh, to say that if a company has subscribed sort of gender clause in, uh, in its second level bargaining, let's see which is the impact or at least the relation with the, uh, the for example, hiring policy that this company is going to apply in the future. So if actually the collective bargaining can be effective in reducing the gender disparities, 
Um, and the second one, try to link second level bargaining with sexual agreement and explore their evolution in uh, pretty much in line uh, with what Elenia was showing us. So let's see how this type of second level agreements uh, are related or not with sexual level agreement and which kind of coevolution there is between the two types of bargaining. Uh, Thank you, Valeria. Thank you yeah. so much, really. Uh, uh, I speak now to the students that in the meantime, some of them have already left, but please stay until 6.30. So for the last paper, as you can see from this paper, you get quite a lot of information uh, about uh, how the labor market works uh, in, uh, in our countries, uh, plural. Uh, and this is somehow uh, complementary to what you study in other courses, uh, because unfortunately, you don't have any course on uh, labor economics. So take this opportunity at least uh, uh, to get some information about uh, a very important market uh, uh, for everyday life uh, uh, and moreover, of course, for your studies. Um, plus, you have quite a lot of data used from different sources, different countries, so they know to them uh, also for your uh, uh, dissertations uh, eventually. And uh, now we close uh, the, the five presentation. Uh, we start with Virage, with the quantitative side of the Italian study within Virage. And now we close instead with a qualitative study uh, stemming from Virage and concerning three different sectors uh, in Italy. This is a paper by Erika Loe that is going to present it. Um, Eleonora Del Vecchio that is here with us uh, and myself. And everything is already, as I said at the beginning and you find it also in the chat, is available on the Virage website. Erika, the floor is yours. Okay, can you see the presentation? Yes, yes, okay. very well. Uh, thank you all and thank you in uh, particular to Valeria and Armanda for uh, sharing their study, which I think is kind of complementary to our study because they look at uh, uh, industrial relations from uh, in Italy from the quantitative point of view. And now we will present our study th that will look at uh, a, a qualitative point of view. Um, as as mentioned by Marcella, uh, let me, I don't know why my slides don't move. Sorry. Uh, I don't know why I cannot go to the following slide. Mm -hmm. No way. Nothing. Mm. Sorry. <laughs> I don't know how to do. <sighs> Nothing moves. Erika, you can just exit the full screen. Yes. yes, I'll try. No. Oh. Mm -hmm. uh. Let me try again. Okay, okay, sorry for that. Now it works. Uh, so, um, uh, I'm going to present uh, uh, the qualitative part of our study that focuses on Italy. And uh, um, the the study is presented in a report and uh, Marcella shared the link to, to the report where you can read it. And uh, it is, uh, the report is divided in, uh, in five sections. Uh, the first two sections um, concern uh, the, the desk research 
and uh, the three following sections concern the qualitative study. For the qualitative study, uh, we um, employed interviews and focus groups. Uh, the interviews uh, were conducted with social partners and, uh, and the focus groups uh, were conducted with uh, workers in three different sectors, industry, services and public administration. Uh, for what concerned the, the first uh, uh, two parts of the, of the reports, of the report, um, we uh, describe the, the background from the point of view of uh, um, um, bargaining mechanisms and uh, from the point of view of legislation and uh, institutions that deal with gender equality in Italy. Uh, I will highlight just uh, uh, a few points from uh, our background. Um, the first one is that union density is one of the highest in Italy. Uh, in 2019, it was 32%, and we could confront that uh, with the uh, study presented uh, by Carla, uh, where she showed that in Spain and, and Netherlands, uh, union density was much lower. And uh, collective bargaining represents the most important mechanism for regulating um, sorry, and defining terms and conditions of uh, employment. And uh, the worker status of 1970 uh, strengthens unions' rights in the workplace. Uh, gender equality in the labor market is proclaimed in the constitution and discrimination is condemned by law. Uh, for what concern uh, the uh, no, um, before going to the institution, uh, I would like to, to add that uh, only in 2021, the Italian government adopted uh, its first national strategy for gender equality. Uh, and before that moment, we only had uh, legislation that address single issues regarding gender equality in the labor market. And uh, these uh, measures uh, focused mainly on the provision of childcare services and uh, different kinds of incentives for employer who hire women. For what concerns the institutions uh, that uh, defend and promote uh, gender equality, um, the, the National Code of Equal Opportunities Between Women and Men of 2006 provide uh, the legal framework for gender equality and establishes the institutions responsible for the promotion and the protection of gender equality between women and men in uh, all areas of society. Um, about the, the qualitative part of our study, as I told you, uh, we developed 10 interviews and three focus groups. Uh, we, we had 10 interviews and uh, five was uh, cross-sectorals uh, with um, trade unions and employers organizations and five were national with government agencies, institutions, and NGOs. Uh, among the profiles involved, we had uh, a general secretary from a trade union, uh, five policy experts, three entrepreneurs, and one manager of human resources. Uh, our gender composition was balanced between women and men. Uh, for the focus group, we choose uh, uh, three sectors. For, uh, for industry, we choose transport. For services, uh, we choose finance. And from public administration, we choose public universities. 
uh, each focus group was composed by a minimum of five, six workers. And uh, we uh, selected the participants uh, aiming to represent everyone. So we had both women and men, uh, people with different regional and migration background and of different ages. Unfortunately, uh, the time is tight, so uh, I cannot go into the specificities of the interviews and uh, of the focus groups. So I will uh, only present the, the conclusion that we reached. Uh, the desk research highlighted that to solve the issue of gender equality in the labor market, an overall approach would be necessary. And in 2021, the Italian government adopted uh, for the first time a national strategy of, for gender equality. Um, the goal of the strategy is to achieve, to, to earn five points in the AGE Gender Equality Index ranking by 2026. And uh, the strategy highlights uh, five priority areas to achieve this goal, work, income, skills, time, and power. Uh, the strategy is very new, so the effectiveness and the result remain to be evaluated in the future. Uh, for what concerns the conclusions to the qualitative part of our study, uh, most of the respondents, uh, both in the interviews and in the focus group, uh, listed gender care gap, uh, work-life balance, and gender occupational segregation as the most relevant dimension that should be addressed to achieve gender equality in the labor market. And in particular, they highlighted that time availability not only as an impact on women's working opportunities in terms of career advancement, but also on their retribution, on their wages, as highlighted by Julia. And uh, uh, most of the people interview recognize the importance of horizontal and vertical segregation of women in the labor market, but there was no agreement around the idea of introducing gender quotas. Um, Social dialogue is uh, fundamental in order to create change. And this was highlighted in the interviews and in the focus groups. Uh, however, in particular, in the focus group, the participants said that unions are seen as having corporative dynamics. That is uh, that they exclusively uh, represent the rights of their members and they are still unable to uh, defend the rights of um, certain typologies of jobs and contracts uh, as a temporary and a typical contract uh, that uh, are usually represented uh, in the majority by women and uh, young workers. Uh, moreover, it seems that when it comes to collective bargaining, there is little room for the pursuit of gender equality. And again, about the gender bargaining and the uh, uh, collective bargaining and gender equality, the participants to our study uh, said that the pursuit of gender equality should be included among unions' goal, not only in terms of campaigns, which the unions already do, but also and more largely when entering uh, collective bargaining. And in particular, as highlighted by the participants in the focus group, there are three areas of collective bargaining where unions should do more in terms of uh, gender equality. Um, the first is to ask for early childcare in the workplace and uh, uh, in terms of cash bonuses where workplaces are too, too small for having childcare in the workplace. And uh, the second is to fight uh, for temporary and precarious workers uh, who, given the career structure, as we mentioned, are very often represented by young workers and women workers. 
And third is to give increasing attention to work environment, which is most significant to women as they suffer a higher risk of sexual harassment, informal discriminatory practices, and sexist behaviors. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. I, I thank you, Erika. To, to, to be faster because I saw that it was already 12.30. Uh, 12 no, it's okay. No, no. You. <laughs> Thank you so much. No, no, thank you so much. Uh, you did the right thing because otherwise the students would leave and wouldn't hear the all the presentations. So in any case, we have 30 minutes for the discussion. Uh, so plenty of time for uh, changing uh, views, uh, comments and so on. I'm just sorry that uh, Julia couldn't come back. So let's concentrate uh, the discussion on the four papers that see their authors uh, here. And of course, I welcome uh, the contribution by the other members of Minerva Lab, uh, in particular by Francesca Tosi and Lucia Morosti, but also, of course, uh, all the others, uh, Giulio Guarini, Carlo Di Politi, and so on, uh, because uh, especially Lucia and Francesca are uh, both involved in studies of this type, uh, either from a statistical point of view or from uh, a sociological one. So, uh, who wants to start? Uh, of course, uh, uh, okay, there are comments already. Many thanks for these very interesting papers. But anyway, so who wants to uh, break uh, <laughs> break the ice, as we say in Italian? And welcome, of course, to Anne Sophie Bruno that uh, in the meantime uh, <laughs> has arrived. <laughs> Don't be shy. Valeria, please, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I have just a question for um, Carla and Diana. Um, maybe I missed a point. Uh, I think your work is really interesting. You focus on flexible work arrangements. My, but um, I mean, did you distinguish between internal flexibility and external flexibility in the sense that maybe companies can uh, pursue policies uh, related to uh, external flexibility, so for example, type of contract they would like to use uh, to, for hiring, uh, uh, or internal flexibility in the sense of more or less, uh, most of all, work, work time arrangements, uh, type of part time, vertical or horizontal part time. So, my point is when you are discussing flexible work arrangement, on which one you are actually focusing, internal or external flexibility, because at least in Italy, this is really relevant. We answer immediately or we collect Yes, questions? yes, Carla, please, go uh, on. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, we actually had this, this uh, discussion, uh, of course, and we focus on the more internal part uh, of flexibility. We do not use this uh, difference because, unfortunately, we're not seeing yet into inside the clauses uh, of, the, of the flexible bargaining uh, contracts so we cannot see at the moment what's the context the, the content sorry so we know of course that uh, collectively bargain flexible work arrangements are not necessarily good because they are collectively bargaining so the, the content of that we have to uh it's that's further work that we have to do and explore but now what we're looking at and we're relating that to uh, employee friendly versus employer driven uh, is uh, what we're doing with the flexible work arrangements. And then, as I mentioned uh, before, these are all clauses that are mostly protecting uh, employees in flexible hours, um, teleworking, changing work status, and extension of uh, leaves. Jana, I don't know if you can... Yeah, I think I would just add that... Um... At the moment, in terms of the clauses that we have coded, so what we know is more or less in which direction they tend, right? So we've coded if there are clause, flexible work clauses about uh, the right to request different working times or about extended leave and, and options like that. So to that extent, what we're coding at the moment and what we have in the data set really focuses on internal flexibility. So we're not looking at things like temporary agency workers uh, and the kind, really at things where you could conflict uh, or contrast the uh, the interests of the current employees uh, and of uh, the employers. 
Thank you, both of you. Uh, Erika, you wanted to ask a question? Yes, or a comment? I, I, have a, I have a question for Valeria and Armanda, because as, as I mentioned, I think that their, their study is complementary to our study. So I was really interested about uh, uh, the companies that apply gender clauses. So you said that there are less companies that do second level bargaining, the percentage is uh, uh, smaller, and there is even a smaller percentages of companies about that apply uh, gender clauses. So I was curious about the numbers, uh, if you could say something more about that. Uh, yes, I mean, uh, the percentage on this survey is about 4% of companies signing second level agreement. You know, in Italy, the second level agreement is, ma is mainly supplementary to the sectoral one. So these are companies signing sectoral level, plus on the top of this also you have the second uh, level, so the firm level bargaining. Among these companies, uh, you can have different type of uh, content no, in the contract. And it seems that uh, the percentage of those signing, uh, including gender issues in their second level bargaining is about 4%. Uh, in terms of uh, absolute number, in the database, these are 270 companies, so not so many. And this can be an issue for the type of uh, econometric that we can do, but I mean, uh, the total number of companies uh, doing second level bargaining is about uh, 1,500 companies. Uh, so of course we apply the uh, sample weights, but the numerosity is not so high. It's uh, more, uh, I mean, uh, around 300. This is the numerosity in the, in the database. Armanda, do you want to add something about that? No, I think that uh, um, it's um, it's quite enough. I mean, I think that the Erica question was more was less on the econometric side, I guess, and more on the political implication no, of this uh, scarce diffusion. I think um, we, with respect to gender bargaining, uh, gender clauses in collective bargaining, I think that uh, in Italy we face two issues. So the first one is that, as Valeria said, collective bargaining at second level is very um, uh, scarcely diffused and concerned mainly big firms uh, where you have a trade union and the rep workers representatives and then there is an issue related to the trade unions also uh, delay let's say in tackling this issue this is maybe something that also you have been observed that, that there is now a more uh, uh, let's say a more intense, more in, more interest from trade unions in uh, tackling uh, this issue, but maybe also from the worker side is more difficult to get these results. So I mean, collective bargaining at second level, first of all, uh, reflects issues and it concerns issues related to wage, uh, working hours, and still gender clauses are seen some, as something that that can be postponed in the discussion in the bargaining. What is interesting, I think, from um, the results is that uh, financial uh, banking uh, sectors, sectors that need to attract, let's say, more skilled workers and also women that are increasing their participation, even in this sector, they are starting to, let's say, they are more active uh, in this, uh, with respect to this uh, issue. I don't know if this is related to um, political orientation or is more something that relates to a management strategy in order also, as Marcella was ironically suggesting, in quoting or any way addressing these issues in order to be uh, re responsible and also to um, be to, to obtain some uh, ranking in terms of corporate social responsibility. So I think that there are many different issues at stage and uh, that's why uh, events like the one that we are doing today are very useful. <laughs> I don't know if it is a uh, Thank you, Amanda. Thank you. Yes, indeed. I read an article today that we must expect a lot of pink washing now in the next uh, few months in Italy because of the new change in the government, uh, as a matter of fact. So, but Jana wanted to ask a question. Please, Jana. Yes, uh, thank you very much. And thanks, everyone, for the presentations. Um, to me, this is a really nice meeting place as well because the papers actually are so closely connected. Um, and so I have a question, I think primarily to Valeria and to Elenia. Um, 
And it's about connecting what you're doing to what Carla and I have been doing uh, with Mara as well. Uh, and so what Carla presented is that we are looking for a bit of a question as to how can we explain who does and does not include bargaining clauses in collective agreements, right? Uh, and we're looking at these two different mechanisms of either is this needs-based or equity-based in a sense of you might expect more of these agreements in um, for workers who actually need more flexible work arrangements because, for example, they, ha they have more care responsibilities. On the other hand, it might be easier to negotiate these agreements exactly in sectors where they, uh, where workers are less easily replaced, where workers have other options, higher wages, etc. Uh, and I'm looking at the results that uh, Valeria presented in terms of the effects of the share of female workers and the share of managers. Uh, and I'm wondering how in that context you interpret these results and if you see them as somehow contradictory or as pointing in the same direction. And Elena, I know that you focus mainly on the characteristics of the employer and the, the firms, but I was wondering if in, in the analysis you can say something about the kind of firms, whether they employ um, more women or more highly educated or low educated workers. So I was wondering if you can say anything about these kind of questions and what your feeling is about these mechanisms. Thank you, Jana. So, Ilenia, do you want to start and then I will give the floor to Valeria? Well, actually, um, well, if we can do this again, like next week, we can present another paper. <laughs> and uh, Next seminar then. <laughs> yes. So, uh, well, when you present, when Carl presented your papers, uh, I was uh, thinking, well, this is interesting because uh, um, this issue of the flexibility we observe in our paper. So what we observe is that, uh, well, actually I can describe what happened. I was working with Anne Sophie and we were discussing about this um, um, this um, issue of our flexibility. And I and uh, and we are both working on this with kids at home. And I asked Anne Sophie. But do we want to flexibility? Do we really want to go back home? I mean, is really flexibility something that is uh, uh, that share anything with gender equality, or maybe it's actually going in the opposite direction? Uh, so when we had this um, uh, discussion. Um, uh, we start thinking about the going further in our analysis and separating the different uh, uh, concrete measure. Uh, that we individuated inside the, the, the text. And uh, so we separated all the things related to flexibility. So all the measure that gives women- Elenia, maybe yeah. switch off the camera because the audio is not very good. Maybe if yes. we switch off, okay. Yes, thank you. Um, so we, um, we separated the, uh, the concrete action related to um, flexibility, we created a separate categories. And what we observe is that low skill workers for flexibility, while high skill so managers, uh, white colors, they ask for other things. So, and that room first, this is something that we will uh, uh, present in, in, uh, in our next. And they were. Um, we observed is that uh, the, the, the female workers do not want flexibility. Uh, they don't want to go back home. So this really questioned the idea of flexibility itself. Uh, so this is what we we observe, and I, I hope this somehow answer uh, to your question. Yes, Elenia. Before giving the floor to Valeria, there is Lucia who wants to jump into the conversation. If you don't mind, Valeria, I allow Lucia to, to join the conversation and then I will give you the floor. Lucia, Hi, please. Everyone. Hi, everyone. Uh, actually, I'd like to, um, I have a question for Erica. So if you want to close this. Uh, uh, okay. No? Oh, okay, fine. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Valeria, please then. Okay, uh, yes, um, the relation between share of female women, uh, the workplace and the share of manager. Well, it's not surprising to our views because uh, we know that in Italy, 
First of all, second level bargaining applies to a sort of aristocracy of company, the more productive. And uh, it's not so uncommon that in this place you have a higher share of high skilled workers. In fact, at the beginning, when I used the share of college workers, uh, uh, workers uh, having a tertiary educated uh, level, uh, this, uh, this variable was significant. Uh, then when I include also the job title, the position, uh, the, and I mean, the significance was, was absorbed by this um, ISCO category in, in, the, in a sense, no? in the job profile. Uh, and I think this is much in line uh, on what Armanda was saying in the sense that in, uh, in uh, good job places where you have um, second level bargaining, so uh, a, a high share of women working in this place, which is usually our uh, company working in the sectors, in the services and high value type of services such as finance, no, and this kind of uh, services, then you can have a sort of bargaining concerning uh, the application of uh, gender clauses that may be related with the uh, work-life balance and other type of issues. So it was not surprising actually that uh, you have a, a good strong effect for a share of women and also share manager. Also consider Jana that we are controlling for aggregate sector. So in a sense, I mean textile, no? which is the typical sector where you have a higher concentration of women, but they are uh, they have low wages and usually un also poor bargaining. This is actually captured by our dummy. So he, here in this case, we are, uh, like seeing which is are the, the main pattern. Um, in terms of flexibility, uh, well, uh, I agree that uh, uh, both internal and external flexibility can be really dangerous if, if, if they are not uh, negotiating and well uh, and agreed between the parties. Uh, in our estimate, for example, uh, we were uh, expecting a negative association with share of, of part of a temporary worker this didn't show up uh, but in other works actually we uh, we see that that usually when you have uh, uh, high external flexibility you have low power of workers in terms of bargaining and this also apply when there is in high internal flexibility in terms for example of part-time or, or both horizontal or vertical part-time so I think that uh, flexible work arrangement at least in Italy can be related with weak union power and weak uh, uh, power in terms of uh, I mean uh, of workers when they have to bargain uh, on several issues included included gender issues so of course, this is something that we should focus on and try to see what actually is included in this flexible work arrangement, because most of all, they are related with concern employer type of request when they have to face demand fluctuation because they, uh, this, these companies are operating in a sector which are really dependent on the demand. Thank you, Valeria. Lucia, please. Okay, hi. Uh, thank you all for your very interesting and useful uh, presentation. I have a question for uh, Erika. Uh, you mentioned the uh, workers' ideas about uh, um, the internal dynamics of unions uh, defined as corporative dynamics. Uh, did you uh, further investigate also unionist idea about the internal dynamics, especially uh, women within uh, unions? What do they think about the internal dynamics of uh, um, organization and uh, their participation to the decision process also across different sectors? And uh, yeah, the, this was basically my, my question. So uh, what uh, if, if you have uh, investigated this, uh, this topic or not? And um, if yes, um, what emerged? I mean, what are the ideas of um, women within unions about the internal dynamics? Uh, there is this overall approach to gender issues within unions uh, or not? Thank you. I, I think that the best thing that I could do is to leave the floor to Marcella on this because she was the one that conducted the interviews uh, with the trade unionists. So I think that she could best uh, reply yeah, I'm sorry, I apologize, Lucia, but I was just checking a message from Julia in the meantime, so I didn't hear your 
your your question um i apologize really my apologies no can you please okay. tell me again yeah uh, my question was um uh, did you further investigate which is the idea of uh, women within unions about the internal dynamics in terms of representation no, no okay. actually no we didn't uh for a simple reason uh, that um all interviews have been done according to a common uh, format uh, I've forgotten to say that Virage was a four country comparison. So Italy, Sweden, uh, Poland, uh, and, uh, and Belgium. And of course we were four partners. So the University of, of Leuven uh, in, in Belgium, the Warsaw School of Economics in, uh, in, uh, in Poland, um, um, the University of Gothenburg in Sweden and Sapiens of course uh, in Italy. Uh, and also due to the differences you can imagine between Sweden and Poland, but even between Poland and Italy, of course, in terms of uh, participation in trade unions uh, and, and so on, uh, we had really to stick on a common format that, that, that would be valid for all. Um, so there was really not much room for discussing about, uh, let's say, a sort of feminization of trade unions, if, if this is something that you that you have in mind. Um, of course, uh, uh, it's quite clear that uh, uh, the, 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 the horizontal segregation in the labor market, uh, so the fact that women uh, are more concentrated, for example, in textile and men in construction, influence, of course, also the presence of these uh, of this, um, of this workers uh, in the trade unions, uh, and of course, influence the degree of, of feminization. Uh, but as a matter of fact, uh, this was not much discussed. What we could do, as a matter of fact, was in the focus group. Uh, in the focus group, uh, uh, we explored four specific uh, um, uh, labor markets. Uh, for the industry, we analyzed uh, uh, transports. For uh, services, uh, we analyzed uh, the financial services. And as a matter of fact, we had a discussion uh, on, on this week in, in uh, on May, oh, see, oh, sorry, on Monday, <laughs> um, together with uh, some uh, trade unions, also, uh, for example, Uni Europe Finance in another seminar. Um, and for the public administration, we discussed about. Uh, public universities, so the academic environment. For sure, in comparing these three different sectors, uh, we realized uh, that implicitly there were some, um, let's say, biases in terms of uh, the presence of women in the trade unions. So for sure, um, uh, the women uh, in, in the finance sector, which are more present and much more informed uh, about uh, gender equality issues than than some of the women working in the transport sector. But at the same time, for example, women in the transport sector are really very well organized at European level. They have a, a, a common charter, they have a, a common activities uh, and so on. So not necessarily, I could say, the, the number of women involved in trade unions actually had an effect uh, on the efficiency of these uh, uh, trade unions. I don't know whether I answer to your question, but this is the most I can do. Yeah, thank you, thank you. So we have five minutes left. So, okay, Francesca. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for uh, your presentations and uh, to the organizers for this very interesting um, workshop. I wanted to um, ask Valeria and Armanda a question, but frankly, I hope I didn't miss that detail if you showed that. So um, I, um, I wanted to ask you if you considered um, the share uh, or percentage of uh, immigrant workers as a characteristic, uh, as a characteristic of the of the firms uh, you included in, in the analysis because, um, well, migrant background and gender make a very specific intersection, both in terms of uh, working conditions and also in terms of distribution of workers within, um, between sectors, right? So um, if uh, you did, um, or even if you didn't, 
Um, I have a second question uh, that is, uh, how do you plan maybe to integrate that dimension, if you do, uh, in your future research on uh, the second level bargaining uh, using Italian data? Okay. Hi, Francesca. Thank you for your question. Um, no, we didn't include the variable concerning share of my, uh, workers migrants at the company level. Because if I don't remember, uh, if I remember well, this is not, uh, this variable is not in the survey. I should um, verify, I should check. I'm not sure, but uh, I'm, I think we do not have this information. Uh, if we have, uh, we can use it. Although uh, we cannot include so many variables because as I said, uh, the number of actually of companies uh, signing these gender clauses at the second level bargaining are not that many. So we are talking about 300 observation over one, uh, 1,500 uh, observation in total. So we cannot a lot of, uh, of things, by the way, this is really crucial. I agree with you. So uh, actually we should focus if there is this uh, variable, I'm not sure. In the second stage, uh, this will be relevant. Uh, we thought maybe to focus on the type of hiring. So if, this, if companies uh, uh, decide to hire, for example, under a temporary work arrangements, uh, we do not have information on the wage, so we cannot use the wage. So we would like to check if the inclusion of the gender, these gender clauses actually has a, a relation with the um, labor market disparity at the company level. We should build some indicator, uh, but uh, I'm afraid we do not have very much and detailed information about background. Uh, I, I guess we can do something concerning the type of contract, the number of hirings, we cannot use wages, so we should, I mean, this is the, the what we can do. But I mean, in the future, why not? We could try to write an IMSS VC Teams project <laughs> and to explore a little bit uh, more all these things. Thank yes, you, Valeria. So in, in the meantime, Julia came back. So we are all here now. Uh, we have two minutes left. So really for a last uh, question, a uh, flash, uh, a comment. Natalie, Jeremy, I don't know what, if you want to add something to what uh, Elenia said for all of you. And Sophie, of course, uh, even in French, if you like, no problem for that. I just wanted to say that we, we... We wrote a, um, a paper on uh, the, the the share of women and the effect of share of women on negotiating and on um, uh, signing a text. So you can, you can see it. On the oh, that's very interesting. It it actually answers to the question of Lucia then oh. somehow in terms of the role of women within the trade unions or in any case in uh, in bargaining. Natalie, yes, maybe I can. Uh, a small point for first, thank you very much. I think that all these papers are, are very complementary and I will be happy to, to read them again, to have a picture, um, uh, an overall picture and to be better able to, uh, to compare the difference between the countries. But um, so I think there's some further analysis to, to, to do by reading the text, but from from what uh, Valeria and Armanda said, uh, so the context is very different from France because you have so little companies that uh, bargain. Um, uh, but in a way, so 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 you it, we, companies that bargain are much more numerous because of our general French frame, framework where where there are some incentives or obligation to bargain, but. Uh, so even though there is this difference, you are scarce and we are more numerous, we both find that those that, that bargain are uh, specific in terms of, si of, uh, of size, skill of the workforce, et cetera. So what, what we see is that the women that we gain from that firm level bargaining are first the, the, um, the ones that have already a good position on the labor market. So in a way, the, the firm level bargaining uh, first is going to support a kind of a 
elitist equality between men and women. So uh, the, the, the further thought that we have to put into the analysis of the bargaining system is to find how we can extend the, the, the impact of bargaining towards uh, the women that are in the, uh, that have the, the lowest position on the labor market. And the, the, the question here is, it's not clear whether this will ha happen through firm level negotiation or through sector level negotiation. And, uh, and so I, I think that that's the, that's the, the upcoming <laughs> debate, may, maybe for a next uh, seminar. So, but thank you very much for all these very interesting paper, papers and exchanges. Jeremy, do you want to add something? We didn't speak about the, 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 child, uh, the, the child penalty at all. Uh, I'm sorry because your paper was so interesting about that. But uh, you want to say something uh, complementary to what we said before we close? No, I, I have nothing to add. Uh, um, Natalie has, uh, has said the whole. Um, but uh, it will be a pleasure to present the paper on the child penalty uh, on Thank the next uh, session. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, you are already invited. Uh, you are already invited. <laughs> so, well, thank you so much to all of you. Um, I will send you also uh, the invitation to other seminars that we are organizing for the winter uh, uh, season. We have some seminars about uh, informal workers, uh, about uh, platform workers, and so on. One by Valeria as well. So I think uh, we can go on in discussing about um, these topics in, uh, in in several directions. Uh, um, of course, I will also we will also update you with the final, 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 final deliverables of Virage uh, that is really now really going to end uh, in uh, in few weeks. Um, so that's all. Thank you so much. Everything is recorded now. I stop. Uh, the registration, uh, sorry, not the recording, uh, and um, and 